One of the things I think Lucy was addressing in that, but yeah. she always makes it seem so easy. I mean, she gives you the conclusions, but it seemed to me what that made me think of was, you know, what is an individual and what does the name signify and what has that got to do with what artists do? And I think the way I used to think of it, but, but this was when we used to think, it, you know, uh, slightly differently, was that if you think of the culture as a, if you think of the culture as a meal, right, then artists are like waiters or waitresses delivering the meal, but they're not the cook of the meal. Do you see what I mean? The cook is a collective thing. And so that's the thing about names, is people grabbing a territory, really. Is that, that was what you were, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the territory, and of course, the minute you, you do that, that, you want to grab a territory, comes not only colonialism, because the weaker ones get dispossessed, but, but also competition, which is the basis of capitalism. I don't need to tell anybody that. But anyway. Use the use the thing. <laughs> um, you're talking a lot about public art, and a lot of the slides are about public art. And I'm wondering if uh, public art or access in that way is a necessary component of feminist art, and what happens when feminist art gets institutionalized and to the politics of the art once it's in an institution. Well, I don't think it's a necessary component of, public, of, of feminist art. I just wanted to talk about my climate change th stuff. So, <laughs> but I do. But it is—it's one of my major interests. What was the second part of the question? I'm sorry, because that was. Yeah, that's always an interesting question because I know, having worked with political art groups, uh, artist groups for many years since the '60s. We've, we've gone back and forth on this stuff. I mean, at one point, we, we, we've, we've often protested museums, the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan, the Whitney, so forth and so on. But one of the things was like, I mean, we don't want to be in your goddamn museum because it's run by capitalists and, you know, and so forth. I mean, just the sort of obvious uh, lefty rhetoric about, about institutions which was less subtle then than it is now. <laughs> Institutional critique has become kind of something else. But then at a certain point, I think Leon Golub was one of the main people in this. He said, you know, this is ridiculous. We belong in those museums. We're just giving up our, our potential museum uh, participation. I mean, we should be there where the public sees what we've got to say. If they've got Picasso's Guernica in the Museum of Modern Art, which of course they had, but never said anything about the fact that it was an anti-fascist work. They just, oh, it's just this wonderful classic thing from just out of nowhere, and uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, which is just infuriating. So we did protests in front of the Guernica to bring that to people's attention and so forth. So it, it, it go, you know, if you get into museums, you get into the art world too heavily, you can be co-opted if you don't watch out. A lot of very good artists don't get co-opted because they do watch out. So it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of decisions. It's, it's not an easy. Thing to figure out sometimes. I mean, that at the point of your career, what point do you go in the museums or what, and so forth? I never, not being an artist, I don't have this problem, so I haven't really thought about it that much. But, but um, as a writer, I mean, you know, you're always kind of, as somebody said, art writing does not pay. <laughs> so, um, so you 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 have a pretty easy way of sliding under the radar if you're writing about art. Whereas artists, in a curious way, even though we're supposed to have power and artists are only supposed to have influence, <laughs> kind of, uh, we don't always have power. We only have power if we play the game right. And otherwise, you don't really have that much power, which wasn't what you were asking at all. I don't know how I got off on that. But anyway. um, I'm interested in what you have to say about like art-based community development because you spoke about like public art and that kind of interaction with the public. Um, but just like insight about development in that way and also your perspective on that, that way of interacting with the public where it's not necessarily that you're producing a work that they're independently interacting with but that you're helping to facilitate artists work with the public and also helping um, like a broader spectrum of people have an outlet for their creative work and even like understand what that's meaning in their own lives or understanding how they're taking in visual media that's like mass right. produced. I have no idea why I didn't include some of that in the slideshow. It has to do with going through so many slides, I guess, because I've written a lot about that over the years. And I'm, I, that, that's one of the places that artists are sort of anonymous. I mean, where they, 
or working with communities and, and communities. I remember, I mean, communities were not respected in the art world. The notion, I mean, community in itself is a peculiar term and it usually doesn't mean that everybody is in loving harmony. It means that they live in the same neighborhood or whatever, but, but uh, the art world, there were political artists in the art world and then there were community arts going on outside the art world completely. And, and I got pulled up on this by uh, one of my mentors or two of my mentors, Arlene Gobard and Don Adams, who used to run the Alliance for Cultural Democracy, which was originally called Neighborhood Arts Programs National Organizing Committee, which was NAPNOC, and it sounded too knock knock, so <laughs> we changed the name to Alliance for Cultural Democracy. But uh, they, they sat down with me and Jerry Kearns, who was my working partner at the time. We did a lot of exhibitions, demo art, and so forth and so forth together. And um, they just sort of pointed out to us very intelligently that community arts and political art had a lot in common and that political artists had a lot to learn from community arts. And then I joined this, this organization and found, and again, somebody else said this earlier, how provincial New York was. Because, and, and then living in England, which is where I met Susan in the late 70s, also was very interesting because there were a lot more community organizing things that were going on that respected artists were involved with. And in New York, you were, if you were involved with community stuff, you just weren't respected. That has changed. I mean, LAPD, John Malpede's thing, I mean, Suzanne Lacey's work, John Malpede's uh, Los Angeles Poverty Department, which is a performance thing for, with homeless people that's been going on for 20 years now at least. Um, they, I mean, they're just things all over the place. We're, we're, and I don't think artists have to give up their art thing to work with communities, which is what the, the myth has been for a long time. If you have enough imagination and you, and you really know how to work with people, you can work with people to, I mean, I, this giving voice thing is a problem because you're not supposed to be giving anybody voice, but they have their own voices. But, um, and empowering is also slightly problematic. But um, you can, you know, if you really know how to work with people and listen to people, the listening is really important, uh, then you can make extraordinary pieces from inside the issues instead of from outside the issues. And I think that's a really major thing is to be inside the issue. I mean, it should be something you don't just like pick an issue and make art about it. You really have to be it and feel it and know it and so forth. So I'm all for that and I feel bad I didn't include any of that work in the slides. I don't know why I didn't. But. Here we are clutching these phallic objects the whole time. <laughs> well, I, I actually wrote this down because I wasn't quite sure how to word it, but um, so I'll just... Where um, are you? I'm sorry. I'm right oh, okay. Um, is, is the pursuit of art for beauty's sake in the traditional definition of the word valid or relevant in your opinion, given that the human race may now be in survival mode? Could one argue beauty is a necessity as much as activism at this tipping point? Yeah, one could argue it. <laughs> like, um, I, again, I, you know, I, I love looking at beautiful art. I have, happen to really like landscape painting um, because I work with landscape studies really more than I work with anything art these days. And at the same time, uh, this, is, this is really a personal choice. Like I said at the beginning, my impetus has always been like, okay, what can art do? And I, don't, and I think art can be beautiful and still make people think. I mean, I, and art can be just beautiful and not make you think and just make you enjoy. I mean, art can do anything it wants. Artists can do anything they want. But we do, I mean, artists are allowed to make the kind of work they want to make. I figure I ought to be able to work on the kind of work I want to work on. So, uh, you know, I mean, people are, I, I often get this, you don't ever talk about landscape painting. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's like you don't make, how come you don't make political art with prisoners? And, you know, well, well, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, a lot of it is just personal choices. And this has been mine. It's what I've been driven to be involved with. But it's certainly there's, it, all art has its own validity and its own politics, which I think is ignored. Because, like I said, you, you either support the status quo or you resist it. I think a lot of artists prefer not to even think about supporting the status quo, which they are in a lot of ways by just participating in the status quo. That's a, an awful note to go out in. Go in one last question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
I do want to repeat that the film The Heretics will be shown at 3.30 in Seely Hall, room 201. And um, I've been given the task of kind of just doing a concluding remark, which I find like, what do you say after these two days other than it is li lived up to our wildest expectation of being able to get together extraordinary women to talk about and frankly talk about what their creative lives are like and to have this exchange of ideas that I have felt that I have not experienced such a creative um, situation or in my life for um, even in my own work as a visual artist. So I thank you all and I want to um, extend to you, we do not have any or formal um, evaluation, but we will be absorbing this information at the Smith College Museum for some time to come and invite you to please write to us with any comments, suggestions you may have. So you can just write to Real Lives, Smith College Museum of Art, and we will read with um, real interest and intent to see where we go from here and where we can take this conversation. And yes? Could we write Emily Tremaine, thank you? Yes, um, we will forward the thank you to um, Dorothy Tremaine Hilt. <laughs> Yes, uh, so yes, we will do that. So um, goodbye <laughs> and thank you until we meet again. Thank and I you. Will. Yes, I'll wait. No, I, I just wanted to thank Taiga for, for everything she's done, and she's been an amazing organizer. <laughs> Taiga, Taiga, Taiga.